Hi everyone, Angela Lovesaranka here from Lactation Education Resources. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good afternoon, morning, or evening. It's Sakita Lewis Johnson with LER, and I am so thankful that you all have joined us and to give us some of your time to hear what we have to say. So today we're going to talk about becoming a board certified lactation consultant and the realities of being and becoming one. So I my background is I originally became a peer support counselor about 30 plus years ago. So now you know I'm my age and we um, did I did that work for many, many years. Also, I've worked in a hospital, uh, have been board certified for over 25 and I am the program director for LER. Sakita? Yeah, so I became a CLC in 2005. That was my first entry into lactation support. Well, I wouldn't say first entry because I was a labor and delivery nurse at the time. Um, and then I sat for my IV CLC in 2008. I've had the opportunity to work in a hospital, home visiting, and community settings and private practice. And um, yeah. I am the Accredited Provider Program Director for LER. So we'll go ahead and kick it off here. We've got a few things we want to share with you. So without any further ado, if you would like to ask questions or make comments to us, please feel free to do so. You can find the questions box in the uh, on the control panel for the GoToWebinar. And it, we've got a nice little circle here which shows you with that blue arrow where you can find it if you are participating on a laptop or a desktop computer. If you are participating today from a mobile device, then you can find it at the bottom of the screen on your mobile device. And you can see that little uh, question mark there uh, as indicated by the green arrow. So other people who are joining us today are Julie and Kim. Both are IBCLCs and members of our customer support team. They're monitoring the, monitoring the questions in the questions panel and they'll answer some and leave a few for Sakita and I to answer live. A member of our tech team, Jill, is also on the call to help with any tech issues that you may be happening, having. If you're watching this recording on YouTube, please post your questions in the comments below. You can also contact our amazing customer support team at support at lactationtraining.com. So becoming a lactation consultant, let's take a look and let's dive in a little bit at what a lactation consultant is and how you can follow your passion and become one. There are over 34,000 IBCLCs in 129 countries and territories. So you're in good company. Credentialing as a lactation consultant is offered by the International Board of Lactation Consultant Examiners. Take a look at their website, ibelce.org. They have different regional offices depending on where in the world you reside. Review the requirements and the pathways to become eligible to take the IBLCE certification exam. What do you need to know? Well, there's something called the Detailed Content Outline, which used to be known as the Exam Blueprint. It's based on a survey of IBCLCs in a variety of practice areas all around the world. The outline covers all of the topic areas and the chronological stages an IBCLC needs to know in their work. LER courses cover the entire detailed content outline and our courses are approved by LARC. That's also known as the Lactation Education Accreditation and Approval Committee. They approve lactation consultant training courses all around the world. Now, Sakita will review a few questions to ask yourself today. Sakita? Yes, thank you, Angela. So, we are diving into the realities of becoming and being an IBCLC. So, it's some, some quick questions, and I won't say quick, what I would hope is that you have something to write this down with or even put it in your phone as a note to yourself. But before we dive in, it might be helpful to, to really write these questions down. Do I have the skills necessary to become an IBCLC? And when I say the word skills, oftentimes people will jump to the 
hands on, I got to do something. And I'm talking about that as well, but I'm going to talk a little bit about some other skills, some other skills that are required and necessary to provide comprehensive lactation support and care, as well as competent lactation support and care. Um, but the other thing is, is don't be alarmed if after I start going through all of these topics that we're going to dive into or these skills, don't be alarmed if you're like, well, whoa, wait a minute, I don't have that. Just think about where, if you don't have the skills, where will you acquire these skills? So just be cognizant and don't worry if it, this does not make sense the first time I go through it. Sometimes people need to hear it a few times. And so this will be recorded. All right, so what makes an IBCLC? I talked about skills, competency. Competency is crucial. It is necessary to make sure that you're providing the appropriate and safe lactation care. The meaning of competency is that you have the ability, the knowledge, and the skill to do it successfully. So in a nutshell, you know, you won't start off being an expert, but at the very least, you will start off being a competent novice. Culturally appropriate and credible. We're gonna pause and really dive into, when I use the word culturally appropriate, what, what am I saying? Um, if you've worked in healthcare or been around anyone in healthcare, you might have heard the word culturally competent. And I just talked about that word, right? And when you think about the definition of the word competent, one of the questions that comes up for me is, can you ever become competent in someone else's culture? So we really need to be clear, like when we're talking about um, competency, what we're saying, but when we're talking of, as, as it relates to cultural culture, we're talking about either being cult culturally appropriate, culturally relevant, um, some people say culturally sensitive, having cultural humility, you will hear all of those words. Um, as we're talking about language and how you will hear all the different words, it's important to be very clear. We want to make sure we're using terms that make sense. So for me, culturally appropriate is more fitting for where we want to be. And culturally appropriate starts with cultural humility. Cultural humility is defined as a lifelong process of self-reflection and self-critique, whereby the individual not only learns about another cult, another person's culture, but starts with an examination of their own beliefs and cultural identities. And that is a definition that can be found at the National Institute of Health. And that is just one definition of cultural humility because it's really a lifelong process. So when we're talking about providing culturally appropriate support, we're talking about cultural humility. So some people will say things like, it's not in their culture to do X, Y, and Z. That's something that's culturally inappropriate. That's a culturally inappropriate statement. We want to avoid saying things like that because really when it comes to cultures, there are subcultures. So the first part of cultural humility is not feeding in to stereotypes, not making assumptions about what someone will or won't do based on their culture because we really don't know unless that person has told you, hey, this is, these are my beliefs, these are my values, this is what's important to me as an individual. So credibility, that goes along with cultural, um, a culturally appropriate uh, support for me. Um, when you're asked a question and you don't know the answer, how do you respond? Do you try to just say, well, I'm gonna give this answer because this happened with me and this is my experience. Or do you just say, hmm, I'm not sure. Let me get back with you on that. 
I'm asking this, I'm asking you this question because almost everyone wants to tell their breastfeeding or chest feeding story. Seriously, almost everyone. And their stories sometimes begin like, oh, it didn't hurt, or oh, it hurt really, really bad. So you can always reflect on your experience, but as a clinician, you want to rely on the evidence. So being a credible resource means you are giving out information that A, coincides with the best evidence, and B, if you really know what you're talking about. So the, the, the question that I would ask on this is, do you know what the evidence says whenever you're asked a question? And if you don't, do you know where to find it? We're not wa all walking um, smartphones or walking dictionaries or walking computers. It's truly impossible to know everything, but demonstrating um, credibility is about being forthright. Um, I'm not sure about this. Let me get back to you. And then you go ahead, you do the appropriate research that's necessary, and then you get back to the person in a timely manner. That's credibility and it's everything. If you lose credibility, as a lactation consultant or lactation supporter, it could translate to other IBCLCs losing credibility. Policy advisor, creator, and advocate. So a couple of other things we do as IBCLCs is we advise on policy. We actually help create policies, and that's important to know from the standpoint of talking about clinical care. Remember, I asked the very first question, do you have the skills necessary? And some of you in this audience may already work in policy and that might be your strong suit. So it's like, yep, yeah, you got you got it. We need you because as I said before, language is important and the language in policies matter because poorly written policies can end up with unintended negative consequences. So if you are that policy poor, uh, person and that's your thing, you already have that part down. Being a stakeholder, though, is another form of policy work. IBCLCs are stakeholders. So sh we should be at the table whenever lactation specific or related policies are being discussed. So maybe policy is not your strong suit, but as an IBCLC, Trust me, you know, you want to know how policies are created and how they impact us because that then informs your advocacy. Advocacy is a huge part of what we do and who we are. An advocate is simply a person who publicly supports or recommends a particular cause or policy. So even if you're not a policy advisor, so to speak, you can be that person at the table listening and sharing your perspectives on um, how you see the language or this policy either being a good thing or possibly a not so good thing. Problem solver and researcher. Problem, being a problem solver is about 90% of what we do because each family has their own concerns. And when lactation consultants are called for support, it's usually a request secondary to some type of problem or issue that the family may be having with breastfeeding, chest feeding, or lactation. So be mindful about framing lactation concerns from a one size fits all framework, know that one size never fits all. And we really should be problem solving from an individualization lens that of that particular family and, the, and their concerns that they're sharing with you. And along with being a problem solver, remember I, I said you may have to go back sometimes and say, I don't know this and look it up. Well, that's being a researcher. There are two ways that IBCLCs are researchers or two forms of research or two frameworks you can look at. You can be the person who carries out academic or scientific research, or you can be the person whose job involves discovering or verifying information. 
and that's all of us. The discovery and verifying information, again, that adds to your credibility and um, your competence. So remember, we're not walking around with everything in our head, but we have to have valid and reliable tools that inform our practice. Now, I'm going to give a disclaimer before I talk about this um, because I some people are like, whoa, high level lactation care. Just listen to me, don't get afraid. Um, so, but high level lactation care and skilled care go hand in hand. When we talk about lactation care, I'm gonna give you an example of basic breastfeeding care, which is, is like assisting with latch positioning, when a parent are both well, there's no health issues, there's no other problems. They just need a little bit of assistance and, and they are on their way. That's the basic or non-complicated, if you will, versus someone who's in an ICU intensive care unit who was lactating prior to going to the intensive care unit, who has um, been intubated with a breathing tube are you able to deliver the type of care that is necessary for this individual? Are you able to look at the medications and say, whoa, okay, let me check on all these medications and make sure that they are safe. Are you able to think through, whoa, okay, what is this person's, um, why is this person here in the ICU? Perhaps they have a brain injury. Well, does the brain impact lactation? And if so, how? What part of the brain? Are you able to make all of those connections? Now, I just gave you probably the worst of the worst uh, case versus the most non-complicated case. And the, the um, remember, I said competent novice. High level skill care is not where you're going to enter the field, possibly not enter the field, depending on your background. However, putting all the pieces together is how you should be thinking as an IBCLC that's going to build upon the level of skill and the level of care that you're going to be able to provide years after you become an IBCLC. All right. So. Uh, essential and timely. One of the things that we found out during the pandemic is that IBCLCs and lactation supporters are essential. We also found out that essential became a buzzword during the pandemic. Babies are still being born and babies still need to eat. And so, and, and people are still having children having issues. So during this uh, pandemic, Promoting and protecting the ability to provide human milk is crit critically important, not just from the bonding and family standpoint, but also from public health, from a public health and prevention standpoint. So yes, we are essential. And it's important that we show up when families need us, that we are timely, that sometimes we just can't say no, we're in a pandemic now. So that's one of the things to understand is that when folks were talking about frontline workers, IBCLCs are frontline workers. And so I just wanna make that real clear that yes, telehealth is an option. We talk about telehealth. We talk a lot about telehealth recently, but I'm gonna tell you that telehealth is not the end all to, to be all, to be the answer. We can miss some things with telehealth. Telehealth, it can prohibit our other use of our other senses sometimes. So you really wanna be clear on knowing that there's a place for telehealth. We do do telehealth, IBCLCs can do telehealth, but there's also a time and space for being able to supply, to, to supply direct care um, of service. I can recall actually a case during the pandemic where a baby hadn't been seen by a pediatrician. The parent had been calling for support, couldn't get support. 
she said, I need in-home support. Well, thankfully, she got in-home support because it turned out that the baby couldn't effectively feed at the breast because the baby couldn't effectively even feed from a bottle. So the baby had some tone issues. So as the advocate, I come in and I'm like, okay, let me see. Now we need to escalate this to the pediatrician and say, yes, this baby needs to be seen. Um, because this baby will get ill from malnourishment, dehydration, and possibly be rehospitalized. So when I talk about being timely, that's what I mean. We are essential, and it's 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 really prudent in our duty to show up so that we can minimize harms caused to families. All right, collective care partner and this is a word i love if i love this word trusted they go hand in hand as well i love this phrase because what it assumes is that you are collaborating with your client that you are not the center you are not the decision maker you are collaborating and you have to remember that it's the family and their partners, their goals, their fears, it's their barriers that takes precedence over your goals for them. So what am I saying? I'm saying, yes, we all know the recommendations, exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months at least, and now the AAP says at least um, up to two years, like the World Health Organization, we know those things, right? And it's important that we still honor those and we still talk about them. However, we also have to understand that we are collaborating in partnership, in agreement, that when someone seeks our care, that we make sure that we approach it in a manner that we're not overstepping our boundaries. And that's how you become trusted. And, <clears throat> excuse me, trusted to do no harm, to be reliable, trusted to say, you know what? We're collaborating to do what's best for you. So when you go into certain clinical relationships, if you assume hierarchy as the our structures have kind of been set up to assume, what that means is you go in like, yep, I'm the expert. I know all about this. I've been teaching chest feeding and breastfeeding for 15 to 20 years. I'm gonna tell you how this should work right away you're going to lose trust no doubt or when you go in and you just touch someone without asking permission they may have said they want assistance with latch let them tell you what type of assistance they're looking for before you just jump in and start to rearrange and touch and do all those things that's how you become trusted you are collaborating and you're there as their collaborative person Person-centered care. The Institute of Medicine defines pa patient-centered care as providing care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, and ensuring that patient values guide all clinical decisions. So I've talked a little bit about culture, I've talked about collaboration, I've talked about care, the type of care you deliver and how communication works. And the person is at the center of it all. And if you want more information, you can visit the Institute of Medicine's website and you can read a little bit more about person-centered care. Um, I do wanna caution you that person-centered person care has also become a buzzword. Don't let it become a buzzword for you really practice what this model looks like, really practice what this model looks like, and then that you, you will further build up on trust with the client and, and not only just with the client, but within your community and also with other clinicians that work around you. So Angela is going to jump on in, but I'm gonna provide just a little bit more anticipatory guidance um she's going to talk about the pathways and the meat of what you came here for but you want to think about as she's talking what pathway 
do is most um is the most appropriate for you you want to think about your local market like what's happening in your area is the area saturated or are there no ibclc's and lack of lactation support you also want to think about how does all the training and the education that goes into becoming an ibclc how does that fit in with your lifestyle meaning your commitments your job your family all of those things so these are questions to i always say kind of get your your gears going kind of think about these things so that you can really be prepared when you start to make this journey for yourself. Angela, take it away. Thanks, Akita. That was really inspiring. So in order to become an IBCLC, we're gonna provide you with a bit of a roadmap. It can seem a bit complicated, but I'm gonna break it down for you and give you these key components. So first you're gonna choose a pathway. We're gonna come back to this in just a minute. Now, each pathway has three components. The first one is education. The second one is clinical hours. And the third thing you need to do is get ready for the exam. And so the first component, health science is education. It's the typical education for healthcare providers. There are eight post-secondary or university level courses and six general education courses. You can find a full list of each of the 14 subjects on the IBLCE website. You can search for it or you can find a link to it in the handout which is provided. The eight university level courses are, and you don't need to write this down, they're biology, anatomy, physiology, infant and child growth and development, introduction to clinical research, nutrition, psychology, or counseling skills or communication skills and finally sociology or cultural sensitivity or cultural anthropology they can be online or in person as long as the institution is accredited to provide the learning now if you took any of these courses during your college career they count even if it was 20 years ago LER partners with Walden Institute and University, excuse me, with Union Institute and University and Walden University to provide these basic courses. Both organizations are online. The advantage of working with Union is their program director is an IBCLC and has chosen the college courses which meet the IBLCE requirements. If you want to get your bachelor's degree in maternal child health, with a concentration in human lactation, take a look at Union. Another advantage is that both universities will accept federal financial aid. The six general education courses are medical documentation, medical terminology, occupational safety and security for healthcare professionals, professional ethics for health professionals, universal safety precautions and infection control, and basic life support. Now, five of the six general education courses can be taken through LER. The only one you're going to need to search for is basic life support. In many countries, there's an in-person clinical skills check for this training. I have heard of some organization providing this training completely online. It's important to check with your local resources. In the resources, there's a link to the health sciences education guide. The guide provides general descriptions for typical courses in this subject area. Please keep in mind that the IBLCE is international. The names used in their document to describe the courses may not exactly fit the description of the course at your accredited educational institution. It's okay. IBLCE utilizes broad terms with the understanding that there is no universal description for what a course in, say, clinical research should cover. Why are these 14 courses required? The, IBLC, the IBCLC is a standalone credential, meaning you do not need another certification, degree, or license to practice as an IBCLC. Once you pass the exam, you will be an allied healthcare professional. The courses will help you to be prepared for your career, as well as to help you, help you to pass the IBLCE exam. So the second thing is lactation-specific education. Again, LER has got you covered. 
the education should be comprehensive and cover the IBLCE detailed content outline. IBLCE requires at least 90 hours of lactation education. Five hours is on communication skills. Our five-hour course is specific to lactation and breastfeeding care to help in your practice as a lactation consultant. The third component is lactation-specific clinical experience. This can include in-person consultations, telephone consultations, or online breastfeeding and lactation care that supports breastfeeding families. Also, it includes lactation assistance to pregnant and breastfeeding clients and lactation education to families and or professionals. These hours are to be obtained in the five years immediately prior to applying for the exam. Now, how many clinical hours do you need? Well, that depends upon your pathway. So as I mentioned, the clinical hours need to be accrued five years prior to applying for the exam. So this slide shows a quick overview. I'll review more in the following slides. So pathway one is for healthcare professionals and those who provide breastfeeding support through an IBLCE recognized breastfeeding support counselor organization. Healthcare professionals include physicians, nurses, midwives, dietitians, physical therapists or physiotherapists, speech pathologists, and others. Breastfeeding support counselors include those accredited through organizations such as LER, La Leche League International, and the Australian Breastfeeding Association. As of this presentation, there are over 40 organizations that have applied to IBLC and are approved. Now, Pathway 2 applicants must complete a comprehensive academic program in human lactation and breastfeeding through an accredited university program. Their education has both didactic and clinical components, and they require 300 supervised hours working with breastfeeding families. Pathway 3 is a structured mentorship program between an IBCLC and the applicant. The IBCLC or IBCLCs must be in good standing with IBLCE. Those who choose this pathway must have their program pre-approved by IBLC prior to beginning their clinical hours. Now, I understand that this is happening relatively quickly now, like within a few weeks. A quick note, for those of you who have breastfed, chest fed, or provided human milk for your baby, the hours you spent nursing, pumping, and helping your friends doesn't count towards your clinical hours, unfortunately. Now, while 500 or 1,000 hours may seem like a lot, there's a really good reason why. Each candidate needs to have the clinical experience so they can provide competent care as an IBCLC, what Sakita mentioned earlier. If it's any consolation, the number of hours which was required used to be a lot more. I've known IBCLCs who needed anywhere from 2,500 to 8,000 clinical hours just to sit the IBLCE exam. Candidates who are applying for the IBLCE exam through Pathway 1 need at least 1,000 clinical hours. For the candidate who is also a health provider, the hours can be done in a hospital, birth center, clinic, lactation care clinic or practice, or through independent practice as a licensed or registered healthcare professional in a non-healthcare setting. For breastfeeding support counselors from an IBLCE recognized organization, their hours can be earned in person or online. The location and type of support depends on the criteria provided by the recognized organization. The hours need to be counted on an hour by hour basis. Now two important points about clinical hours. One, it's important for you to document the hours as you accrue them. Be very detailed in case IBLCE chooses to audit your application to take the exam. They may want to see that documentation, such as a spreadsheet or another document where you counted your hours. And the second thing to remember is that the thousand hours do not need to be directly supervised. Pathway 3 requires 500 hours of clinical experience. It's best done in a busy practice setting where you can work with many breastfeeding, chest feeding people or those providing human milk for their babies each day, such as a hospital or clinical setting. 
the hours count towards the 500 only when you're actually working with families. Observation hours do not count. Remember, clinical experience is graduated. That is, first you're gonna start with observation, then you're gonna do tasks under supervision, then complete those tasks independently with the IBCLC nearby to ask questions and discuss situations. LER has an internship program with many sites around the United States. Reach out to support at lactationtraining.com and we can connect you with our clinical internship director, Amy Black, to determine if we have a site in your area. If not, no worries. We can give you suggestions on how you can work with your local hospital or clinic to facilitate an internship site. One thing that Amy wanted me to mention here is that you can't start to count your hours towards the internship requirement until both you and the IBCLC are comfortable with you working independently. Most interns spend about 75 hours in orientation before they can begin to accrue the 500 hours. Or you can take a look in your community to find a willing internship site or mentors. You may need to reach out to many people to find someone with the time, experience, and capacity to agree to be your mentor. It's important to find a good fit. Talk to others who've been through Pathway 3 to find successful strategies with finding a good mentor. Now, while this pathway has an additional step or two, is it worth it? It is. Why? Well, IBLCE reports that students who come through Pathway 3 score best on the exam. I believe it's the mentorship that is that key component. Learning from an experienced clinician is well worth the extra effort involved at the beginning of this pathway. Now, a lot of people are asking whether or not they can accrue clinical hours via telehealth during the pandemic. The quick answer is yes. The longer answer is paraphrased from IBLCE documents from 17 April and 6 October of 2020. IBLCE will allow the use of technology if certain parameters are met. You'll need to pay attention to privacy rules and the Code of Professional Conduct and the clinical competencies for IBCLCs. Another important point is there should be, quote, observation using technology with two-way synchronous audio and visual components, the focus on the mentor providing mentoring and guidance to the applicant. Now, this guidance has been extended until 30 September 2023. It's important to read all of the IBLCE documents listed in the interim guidance. The link to the guidance is found in the resource document in the handout section of the webinar or in the comments which accompany this video. At LER, there are two ways to gather your lactation-specific education. One is LCTP, which is the full 90 hours front to back including the five hours of clinication, clinical, in, clinical skills. The other one is either through our core or bridge course. They are designed to meet your education needs depending on your background and previous lactation training. So first, we have this comprehensive course called the Lactation Consultant Training Program or LCTP. It's a 90 plus hour course, which is eligible for SERPs, CME, nursing contact hours, and CEs from ACNM. It's intended for those who do not have any lactation education and know they want to become an IBCLC. We have more than 35 knowledgeable, experienced, amazing instructors who are practicing lactation consultants, researchers, and authors who teach in our courses, including Sakita and me. Our classes are economical. You can view them on a variety of devices, such as your computer, tablet, or phone. They are optimized for a computer, but they can be reviewed later when you're on the go. We've been educating people in person and online since 1990. We update our course information with the latest peer-reviewed evidence on a regular schedule, but we'll update sooner as new evidence emerges. Have a quick question for the instructor, or you wanna discuss a concept with your fellow students? There are several ways to connect and get the answers you need. We have a very active Facebook group for those who are in our 95 hour course, core, bridge, or exam review, where students can meet each other and support each other along the way. There are people who are IBCLCs in the group as well, and they can support your journey. On the completion of the 95 hour course, you're eligible to take the Certified Breastfeeding Specialist exam. 
the exam is included in the price. Once you pass, you are a certified breastfeeding specialist. This is to recognize you for the level of education you have attained. With this certification, you can begin to collect your clinical hours towards the IVLCE exam. Now, if you're unsure where to start or you already have some lactation-specific education hours, then we have our core or bridge programs to meet your needs. They have the same advantages as the LCTP course. Our initial course is called CORE because it will provide you with the core lactation education you need to understand what it means to begin supporting the normal course of breastfeeding. It's 52 plus hours of online education. It covers the basics such as anatomy and physiology, infant growth and development, supporting the preterm baby, medications and breastfeeding, and many more. At the end of the course is the Certified Breastfeeding Specialist exam as well. Now the bridge course is ideal for people who have the basic lactation education components and need an additional 45 hours to qualify for the IBLCE exam. Topics in our bridge course include legal and ethical concerns for the lactation consultant, infant feeding and disasters, breastfeeding the infant with medical challenges, case studies, and clinical skills videos. Not sure where to start? If you're new to the profession, I would suggest the core course. Get your feet wet and see if becoming an IBCLC fuels your passion. Our 90-hour course, as well as the Core and Bridge courses, are also avail available in Spanish. Capacitación en Lactancia is our new website, which provides the same high-quality education found on LER, except in Spanish. At LER, we believe that access to high-quality education should not be limited to those who live in countries with high incomes. We recognize that in many parts of the world, the relative purchasing power of a local currency may make the cost of lactation education inaccessible. As part of our commitment to increasing access to lactation training worldwide, our pricing is adjusted according to the student's country of residence. In alignment with our continued commitment to diversity, LER is proud to announce our Rising Tide Lactation Equity Scholarship Program designed to increase the number of Black and Latinx IBCLCs in the United States. We will recognize one of the greatest, we recognize one of the greatest obstacles to entry into the field is access specifically demonstrated by financial barriers. LER will remove that barrier for Rising Tide scholarship winners. We alternate these scholarships each year, and this year it is a scholarship for aspiring Black IBCLCs. We have three levels of support and scholarships. The first one is Rising Tide One. It's in our ongoing commitment to our community partner organizations, we provide annual scholarships for 95 hours of lactation training to awardees who are selected by those partner organizations, such as the New Orleans Breastfeeding Center, Black Mothers Breastfeeding Association, Black Breastfeeding Week, Reaching Our Sisters Everywhere, the DC Breastfeeding Coalition, and the Indian Health Service. Rising Tide II is appropriate for those who have finished or who are already enrolled in a program to complete their health science requirements. This scholarship covers the 95 hours of lactation education from LER, clinical hours through Pathway 1, IBCLC test prep books, and IBCLC exam fees. Rising Tide 3 is the most comprehensive, and that is for those who have not begun accumulating their health science course, coursework. Rising Tide 3 covers the 95 hours of lactation education through LER, clinical hours through LER and Pathway 1, health science coursework online through our partnership with one of our universities, IBCLC test prep books, IBCLC exam fees. The applications for scholarship are open now until August 15th of 2022, and you can apply by going to our website, lactationtraining.com forward slash rising tide. Our team is here to help you now and in the future. Tech support is open seven days a week. Get your questions answered about the content by experts in the field, and we have ongoing support for your next steps in your career. Last week, someone reached out to one of our instructors with a question from their own practice. 
We made the connection and the former student received the answer to help their client. Another student had a question about creating a policy at their hospital and we found the appropriate instructor to answer the question and provide additional resources. We are here to help you to support your journey. Thank you for your time today. Now, Sakita, how about some questions? Any questions in the chat that got your attention? Yes, thank you, Angela. That was great. Uh, so there is a question and I'm not sure you may be able to answer it or we may need to ask for additional clarification, but here goes. It says, is there a good scope for a lactation consultant in the UK? I don't see vacancies for LC in NHS job portals. Are you muted, Angela? I did mute myself. In the National Health Services uh, in the UK. Yes, I understand. And actually, I would highly recommend, um, specific to the UK, is to reach out to um, the Lactation Consultants of Great Britain, LCGB. They probably, and any questions about you know, scope of practice and or practice and or jobs and things like that, reach out to your local or national or regional uh, lactation uh, group of people. Either lactation supporters, IBCLCs, LCGB is a phenomenal organization. Um, IBCLCs do have a scope of practice, a code of professional conduct and such. And so you can find that on the IBLCE website. As a CBS, we too have a scope of practice, standards of practice as well. And so you can find that on our website. We have a link on our website as well. And so as far as vacancies for LC jobs in, in the NHS in, in Great Britain, I would say reach out to LCGB and see what you can find. Zoe um, is there, um, is the, I believe the board president and she's very helpful. She's very knowledgeable as well. Thank you, Angela. There's another question, and this question says, hello, I am actually a pediatrician, and I took the lessons in LER, and I also had clinical hours in my education years as a doctor in pediatrics. Should I also have a mentor? And it looks like, it looks like it's been answered. <laughs> okay. All righty. Oh, actually, Sakita, <laughs> this is not something which, uh, uh, fortunately, there's another person from the UK on the call, and they okay. don't have good news. They say, I can help with the UK question. The NHS does not hire IBCLCs as a standard, unfortunately. Often midwives choose to take the training themselves. So this person is a former NHS employee and manager. So while disappointing news, I think you know, one thing I know about the lactation profession in general, and that is, is that the credential is young, meaning it's only 40 years old. And every single lactation consultant, every IBCLC, every lactation supporter in every country around the world in these, in these 129 countries and territories have had to educate the people and the leadership as to what an IBCLC is, what we do, why we do it and why it's important. Because lactation care is unfortunately not necessarily something which is covered by many health professions around the globe. Now many will do so as sort of tangentially related to their jobs, such as the midwives mentioned in the UK. Unfortunately, it's not something where you have someone who's dedicated. And you know, IBLCE actually does a practice analysis. It's either every five years or every 10 years where they query IBCLCs around the world in order to determine, is there sufficient information and evidence about what an IBCLC does, which is unique to that offering that sort of care? And indeed, it is. And so educating others, educating leadership in hospitals and in your country and in your community is something which I would highly recommend that you get involved with and, and take part in. And the reason why is because just as I know Zoe is working hard in Great Britain, you know, many of us have worked hard for many years in order to educate folks. And so I say that advocacy piece that Sakita mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, that is something which is important and sometimes it may be necessary just to let people know what you do as an IBCLC. Thank you for that, Angela. There was another question flagged. 
and this person is asking if they are working in the Leche League doing Pathway 1, should they, could they do potentially Pathway 3 and count them the same? I'm trying to find the question. It just so <laughs> Ibel C, I've got it. Ibel C doesn't it okay. prefers that you follow one pathway all the way through. And as I mentioned, you know, pathway three may seem appealing because it's fewer hours. However, as a La Leche League leader, you have the supports that you need in order to sort of get that mentorship from the professional liaison department. And so I would say, um, even though it's challenging, it may be best to stick with pathway one because you know you never know what could happen. I would also suggest though that, you know, you may not want to just poo-poo the idea of, of pathway three. Take a look in your community. Are there IBCLCs who can support you and who can mentor you? And so you may find someone either through the professional liaison program or within La Leche League itself who would be willing to mentor you. And so that may be a good way for you to balance and juggle the, those two different things. Yeah, that's a great response, Angela. There's another question. Um, how much, huh, about how much does the exam cost? And that is uh, something that the IBLCE sets, uh, but right, right now, how much is it, Angela? I can't, is it like 500, 600? Six hundred and sixty dollar US dollars. I actually did take a look at that just yesterday um, for um, regarding another scholarship that we're working on. And so indeed it's 660 US dollars. They do also have international equity pricing. And so it depends upon your country and where you will be sitting the exam. So they do take into account currency variations and are uh, uh, priced for uh, middle income countries, low middle income countries, you know, low income countries as well. So. Okay. Um, one more question. Well, no, we have time for a few more. I'm sorry. I've been in IBCLC since 2001, now recertifying by SERPs. I'm a clinical psychologist and have a, um, looks like master's in education in psychological counseling from the University of Miami. I just completed the LER course. How many SERPs will I be granted? I guess that depends on the course that you're talking about. Are you talking about the 95 hour course? Are you talking about the, any other courses with, with um, LER? Just asking for a little bit more clarification on that one. So you're looking for clarification. Okay, good. How often do you pay and take the exam? So, you don't have to take the exam anymore. <laughs> you do have to <laughs> recertify. Yeah, I'm saying that in a, yeah, You're I relieved. had to twice. So, <laughs> Angela might have had to take it more than me, so I guess I shouldn't be upset about this. But, um, but now you have to recertify by SERPs. Uh, so you will not, you will take the exam the first time and then every, at this point, every five years, you have to, um, I heard someone use the word recertify. I don't know if that's something that's an inside joke or if that's something Angela said or somebody else said on my team. Oh, but no, yeah. that's, uh, that's definitely Jeanette and I will give full credit to Jeanette <laughs> yeah. who is our communications and marketing director and, uh, I like recertify myself, so yes. Um, and, and actually, Julie just commented here. Um, Julie from our customer support team says that recommend that the person write into support at lactationtraining.com, and they are more than happy to take a look at your account and let you know uh, exactly the number of SERPs which are available, as well as the amount of SERPs should be listed on the top of the course. So when you actually go in to take the courses, the number of SERPs which would uh, would be there. So, okay, good. Um, what else is here? Let's see. I did notice another question that... was here that I wanted to address. So somebody um, wanted the... 
um, website for the scholarship, it is lactationtraining.com forward slash rising tide. I will say um, that this is a very competitive scholarship. In other words, when we did this two years ago, we literally had hundreds of applications. And so please do be aware that it is very competitive. And so, you know, bring your best game when you are when you're answering those questions. If English is not your mother tongue, that's fine. Um, but please do um, please do um, be thoughtful about your responses because um, they will be they will be looked at very carefully. Okay, someone is yeah. ask. Oh, go ahead, Sakita. Yeah, there's a question. It says, uh, in the future, when I provide lactation support, I would like to find the best evidence-based information. Can we be provided with the most appropriate resources, articles, journals? I want to be able to provide the best, most recent updates and information. I know that it will be ever-changing. I love this question. Um, so, the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine of Clinical Protocols regarding clinical management of common breastfeeding concerns, and they're updated as the information comes out. I would also say, um, you know, there is value to memberships in, of certain organizations where you can receive journals um, and hot off the press on what's the latest information. And so check into, um, and I don't want to endorse any, any, but check into all of the lactation educate, lactation affiliated, I'm sorry, um, organizations that put out journals. Um, and also textbooks, you know, don't sleep on textbooks. Textbooks are being updated. Um, the core curriculum is one. Um, and we do have on LER's website for our students um, discounts if, if you're a student of ours to be able to purchase some of the um, texts that you think are appropriate for you at a discounted rate. You just have to go through our website in order to do it. Yeah, no, just you just have to go through our website in order to do it. But yes, we yeah. do provide you with the evidence. And if there is a lack of evidence or if the evidence is older, we mention that in the lessons. You know, there are some things, um, you know, as I said, like, you know, lactation consulting, the IBCLC is only 40 years old. And there's not a lot of not a lot of money in breastfeeding research. And so just understand that that's one of those things that we we continually strive for. Sakita especially is always continuing to continuing is frequently striving for that. And the reason why is because we want to make sure that our education meets the accreditations that we carry and that we hold and that we can provide to you for continuing education as well as for lactation specific education. So that's great. Yeah. I see another question and it says to clarify as a current RN, would I only need to do the courses offered by LER and complete an internship prior to the exam or am I missing a step? So as an RN, what you would have to do is to complete the SERPs that are necessary to sit for the exam, as well as all of the clinical hours if you're doing pathway one. Now keep in mind, um, and, and I can say this as a, as a labor nurse who became an IBCLC, I could not use all of my hours as my labor and delivery role because I didn't just do lactation support the entire 12 hours I was there. And so you really wanna be real intentional with making sure you're capturing your hours if you're doing pathway one. Um, anything you wanna to add to that, Angela? No, I think that makes, I think that I agree with that statement. You know, it, and there is a practice calculator. I don't know if you just said this, but there is a practice calculator on the IBLC website. Yes. So, and then they take you for your word. You know, I will say that um, through pathway one uh, to a point, but they may need, if you're chosen for audit, they may, you may need someone like your supervisor to sign off that you actually completed this much time. You know, so working as, and this is to sort of address another question. Someone said, how long will it take me to, to get those clinical hours? Well, remember that a full-time job is 2000 hours per year, approximately in the United States. Therefore, in order to get 500 hours, that would you that would mean you would need to work a, a quarter time for a year, 
or so that's you know 20 25 hours every week that you would need to work no i'm wrong on that that's not quarter time it's more like 15 hours per week sorry math in my head quickly uh, so you would need to work that many hours per week and so when you actually think about it in that way and do the math then you can try to determine how does this fit as Sakita mentioned earlier how does this fit with your job with your family with every other commitment that you have and so once you can figure that out then you can determine how much time you can allot to providing that sort of clinical support and, and accruing those hours yeah thanks angela there's a question what is what is the etiquette when asking someone to mentor you so the etiquette is it, for me, and this is a personal thing, but to build relationship, you want to build relationship. Um, as an IBCLC, you know, there's not a lot of us. And so we get requests for mentorship all the time. And so really understanding your mentorship relationship and understanding the person, I would say building relationship, which means putting yourself in, in surroundings, if you have a local coalition, if being involved and being active, um, and for me, be, you know, being passionate about this work, demonstrating passion and integrity, and all of those things that to do no harm, um, I think goes along, I can't stress it enough to establishing um, a great mentorship relationship. That's a great question. It is, and I think it's important to note that this is, important for not only trying to find an individual mentor but also let's say that you do want to do pathway three and you want to work in a healthcare facility or a hospital or clinic or something you know the thing is is that the um it's important for them to have that relationship with you so for example we have you know many sites around the united states in order to that we where we have current relationships where they're will they know us they're willing to take our interns and and it begins that way however the first thing that we ask the intern to do is to meet with the potential uh clinical site to see if it's a good fit because good fit is really a very important thing to do and so and also know that if you are inquiring about uh whether or not you can have an, a specific ibclc be your mentor and or a specific you know site understand that it is it, it, the person probably is busy. <laughs> and so if you send them an email and expect a response by the next day or even the day after and you don't receive one, just be patient and be kind and, and you know compassionate and understand that they will get back to you. And it may take one or two or more um, emails or calls to that person just to see if they have any capacity and or time to to provide that mentorship. I, you know, personally, I enjoy interns. And the reason why is because they keep me on my toes. And so I really do enjoy having that, but not every IBCLC is like me. And so while I enjoy and I welcome interns and I mentor a lot of different people, not nearly as intensely as I have in the past. So I'm working very little in clinical work right now. I'm here with at LER. And so but the time that I do spend for current people, as well as people who've become IBCLCs, and sometimes they'll come to me just to pick my brain. I love that. So just want to give you that sort of perspective from my point of view and yours as well. I know, Sakita, I know you mentor a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, 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 I do. So someone else is asking here. Oh, sorry you what no i'm just saying it's 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 hard and that's why i've started relationship building and being real intentional about how much i can take on as a person um you know because i still practice and um it's it's really hard to turn people away but so oh, that's, that's so my hard. whole thing about relationship building because i want everybody who wants to become an ibclc to become an ibclc right but again, um, mentors, in order to give people what they really need and not skate over it, because, you know, unfortunately, some folks don't take this serious. I take it real serious because uh, there's, you know, some some 
ways of being that can be harmful if we don't take it serious. And so that's why I started this. Okay, I can't mentor you just yet, but let's build some relationship and maybe one day, or maybe I can help you link up with a different mentor, however that looks like. But there's all kinds of ways. This is true. Okay, so uh, two quick questions. Uh, someone is asking, someone is already has um, their CBS, their 54 hours, and they want to know if they can count their 54 hours towards their clinical hours. And so those are two separate things. And so the, the didactic learning that you do, the book learning that you do, if you'll pardon that phrase, is something which is separate from the clinical hours, which is you actually providing that support to families. Um, someone else is saying, Sakita, I'm still working in labor room, but my experience certificate that I had since October 2020, can I apply it to clinical hours or do you need recently certificate? So I'm not really sure if I understand the question as far as the certificate is concerned. If you were licensed or certified as a nurse since October of 2020, I'm going to make an assumption that you can start to count those hours towards your clinical hours, but I don't think you're going to need a certificate per se that says that you've that you've actually done that clinical care. It's using the practice calculator on the IBLCE website. And if I misunderstood your question, please do reach out to us at support at lactationtraining.com and Julie or Kim will, will route it to the right person. Okay, I think that is it. What do you think, Sakita? I am not seeing any. Um, so, so, oh, one last one. Once an IBCLC, can you open your own practice in the community or do you need the supervision of another provider and only hire it into a practice? It depends on your geopolitical region. As we found out in the UK, you cannot be hired uh, in a in hospital. And yet, and I know that there are several interesting issues in Europe around working directly in hospital or in the clinic. And so indeed, I know of many IBCLCs in Europe who are opening up their own, their own practice. And so that's some of the research that you want to do prior to starting on this journey is to find out how can you practice? What do you want to do? What sort of support do you want to offer? And what are you allowed to do in your specific region? So some of the yeah. homework to do before you get started. I just do want to add to that because that's a, that's a great question. I want to add to it is that if you're in the United States, there's lots of people who start a private practice and the the need supervision of an MD um, it's not necessary. However, you want to be in relationship with the physician. You want to be able to have multidisciplinary care. You want to be known in your area by the physicians, not to have oversight, but to have relationship, right? Because some of us don't have the scope that's sometimes necessary for that full gamut of lactation support. So not that you need supervision in certain areas, but definitely relationship. That's very true. Thank you, Sakita. Yeah. Okay, good. Just answering one last question, and then I think we'll close the webinar for today. Again, you can okay. always reach out to support at lactationtraining.com, and we are more than happy to answer your questions and continue this conversation. Thanks, Angela. Thank you for Thanks, joining us. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.